And, and while we're at it, I just, I know I'm so covered in sweat right now for Jesus. It's really disgusting for Jesus. It's really disgusting for Jesus, but undignified for our Lord. While we're at it, can we give it up for all our priests and religious who have given their lives to Jesus in a way he has? We love you. Thanks, bro. Jesus. Oh, sorry. All right, I got to switch out of that mode. That was pretty awesome, though. I like that a lot. Oh, my goodness. What a great night. What a great weekend. This has been so much fun to be part of this with you guys. I love being here. This is just all good stuff happening here, huh? All good things, right? Isn't it great when we just kind of make it all about Jesus? Then suddenly we have friends, we have family, we have love, we have sharing, we have feeding on Jesus. It's just all good and, and a lot of good things to celebrate. You might, you might come to a, a weekend like this and hopefully it moves you, hopefully it does something to you. You might want to make some changes after this weekend when you, when you go back home. And that's good, that's appropriate, you know, it's good to, to make some changes, maybe... Maybe you're just kind of going to look at some stuff and maybe make some small changes, some big ones. Maybe you're going to decide, okay, when I go back home, I am going to pray before every meal. Simple, right? Maybe you're already doing that. Maybe you've tried to do it um, one time or another and, and you failed at it. But now, okay, I just had a good weekend, a good conference. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray before every meal. And that's good. I'm going to give thanks to the Lord. But... Be careful. If you make that decision, things are, things are going to change. Things might get interesting, and you might have more questions, right? You're going to pray before every meal, but what does that mean? What if you're with different people? What if you're in a mixed group and people don't pray? Are you going to pray silently? Are you going to pray to yourself? Are you going to pray? Are you going to invite other people to pray? What about in a restaurant, right? Restaurants are challenging. Do you want to pray publicly in a restaurant? People might look at you. What if you're with people that are offended, that don't like to pray? Sometimes when I go out with a, a group, it's a mixed group, and I'll have some Catholics in there that I, that I know want to pray, but maybe they're afraid because the rest of the group isn't praying, and they think, well, we're probably not going to pray publicly. And we get into our meal. We order some nice pasta. I wait till they've taken the first bite. And then I go loudly, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Make them choke and gag. Maybe spaghetti comes through their nose. I love that. I like to remind my friends, you know that first, that first meatball you ate halfway down your esophagus? Not blessed. Be careful you don't choke. And if you do decide to pray before meals, then, you know, the next question is, uh, what's a meal? Are you going to pray before snacks as well? You're going to go up to that vending machine and put in your coins and say, Lord, I thank you for this Snickers and the clever little gizmo that is unswirling before me to giveth me this Snickers. May it fall gently on the tray below and end up in my belly. Amen. Are you going to pray before something as, as simple as fruit? When you have a piece of fruit, I, I need to pray before I eat fruit because Jesus said, pray for your enemies, and I hate fruit. <laughs> Especially an orange. It takes so long to peel. Such a mess. Not worth it. I need to pray just for the motivation to peel it. What about a, what about a donut? Do you, yeah, I know some of you say yes, but do you really want to, Is it politically correct today to pray for a donut in front of a donut? You know, donuts are loaded with gluten, and gluten we know is the new Satan today. So you might, you know, might step on a few toes if you pray for a donut. Sometimes when I'm with um, a good, solid youth group like yourselves, you know, I'll, I'll pass on the duties of praying to someone that I know is going to do it. So I'll look at the group and, you know, I'm wondering who's going who's gonna to have the courage, who's going to be bold enough to pray, right? And you find that guy in the group who's he's got the T-shirt on, you know, that says something like, Jesus died for your sins, so suck it up. Quit your whining, you know. 
Or he's got, you know, you get Jesus with those six-pack abs with a cross on his back, you know, big muscles and biceps. You know, this guy's going to pray, right? I'm like, this guy will pray for us, right? He won't be embarrassed to pray. But you ask a guy like that to, to pray before a meal and, you know, you might unleash him on the group in a way you didn't expect. It's like, I'm like, you know, you want to pray for us? Yeah, yeah, Father, I'll pray. Okay, all right. Let's hold hands. All right. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. God, all-powerful God, almighty, alpha and omega, you are the Lord. You are the great one. You are the great I am. The mountains shake before you. The demons run and flee. Send the greatness of your majesty upon these Brussels sprouts. Mm-hmm. Your glory, Lord. Let your glory shine on this spinach salad. And blesseth those who know not your majesty in fresh grief, green leafy vegetables. Amen. You might get a guy like that from time to time. But um, praying before meals is not a bad idea, right? Because we eat throughout the day. And it's good to, to stop and, and give thanks to God. You know, um, Jesus prayed a lot before he ate, right? And we see that in the Gospels. Jesus is eating a lot in the Gospels. Have you noticed? Right, in, in Luke alone, in the Gospel of Luke, we have at least 10 times that Jesus stops and breaks bread and has meals with people. You know, um, Luke had, had clued us in that, that food was going to be important in the gospel. We, we know Bethlehem is, is really a name for a house of bread. And Jesus came to us in a little feeding trough in the manger. So already Luke is cluing us in that meals are, are going to be important for Jesus. And so, as, as Gomer mentioned yesterday, Jesus will eat with tax collectors. Right? And he'll use that occasion to welcome them, to welcome them into his family. You know, sometimes Jesus is the host, sometimes he's the guest at a meal, sometimes he's the food itself. Right? Food is important for him. When, when he's with Pharisees, he's dining with them, and he's teaching them about the glories of the kingdom and teaching them that love is more important than rituals. So he takes these opportunities of, of breaking bread to welcome people into his family, to show them that they belong with him. You know, we don't, we don't sit down at a table with an enemy usually, right? Or even with a stranger. If we do sit down at a table with a stranger, it's in order for them to become a friend, to get to know them better, to see that we belong to one another. So Jesus feeds people in the gospel and invites them into sharing his meal to make them family. You know, to make them, to help them see that they belong at his table, that they belong with him. And really, if you start to look for it in the gospel, it's everywhere. I mean, there's a little girl that he brings back from, from the dead and the first thing he does is he says, give her something to eat. He reminds me, he reminds me of my Italian mother, actually, who uh, food is the answer to everything for my mom. You know, if boy's feeling sick or pale, she'll be like, oh, he doesn't look so good. Give him a cookie. Oh, this little girl's back from the dead. I'll make a sandwich for her. She'll be all right. Jesus himself, right, he, he comes back from the dead. He's risen. He's suddenly with his apostles for the first time. He's showing them the wounds in his hands and his feet. And they're trembling. They're terrified. They don't know if they're going to be in trouble because they ran from the cross, right? And Jesus' first words to them are, I could eat. I'm kind of hungry. What do you guys got to eat? He shows them that food is just a good thing and a normal part of being human. And by sharing food with him, we're brought into table fellowship, you know? We're brought into companionship. The word companion also means to share bread with someone. Companion. 
And that's the invitation of Jesus to, to share, to eat from his table and be changed as we do it. You know, if you think about it, it's everywhere in the gospel. So I'm, always on the, I'm always on the hunt. I want to find uh, a statue or an image of full-bellied Jesus, you know? We get the sacred heart. We get the good shepherd. I want a statue of Jesus that he's like holding his belly going, oh, I'm full, Martha. I'm done. I'm so done. <laughs> because he just keeps dining with people because it's an opportunity, right? And when you think about Martha and Mary and Lazarus, it looks like Jesus was at their table often. You know? You know the stories we have of that family, Martha and Mary and, and Lazarus? It looks like Jesus was just so comfortable with him that with them that he he dined with them often and welcomed them into his family and became part of theirs, showed them that they belonged to him by entering into their home and eating at their table. And of course, it's always an opportunity for teaching, right? We have Martha and Mary, you know the story so well. Jesus comes into their home, and, and Martha is serving, and Mary's just sitting at his feet, and, and Martha's getting more and more upset, and she prays because every time you talk to Jesus, it's prayer. So she's talking to Jesus, and she prays in this way. She says, Lord, tell my sister to help me. Make her change. Make her help me. Make her do something. And Jesus is like, that's not really what it's all about. You know, do we pray like that as well, right? How often do we pray and say, Lord, make my sister do something. Make my brother change. I'll be happy. I'll be peaceful when you change them, when you change other people, right? We pray like that, right? We bring problems to Jesus, and we want him to change other people. And he says to Martha and says to us, no. That's actually not the issue. Actually, Mary has chosen the better part. She's sitting at my feet, listening, and being changed herself. And that's what you have to do, not worry about changing other people, but changing your heart and listening and staying at my feet. And so imagine that. Imagine that home with Lazarus, you know, freshly back from the dead, and Martha and Mary just welcoming Jesus. And, and the beautiful encounter that they have with him shows that um, they, the, these two sisters had even lost their fear of death, right? Um, they go up to Jesus and, and say boldly in faith, we know if you were here, our brother wouldn't have died. And even now, we know that God will give you everything you ask for in a bold profession of faith, they show that they believe more in Jesus than in the power of death, that he can even conquer the power of death because he is the Lord of the living. And they got that faith. Where did they get that faith, right? It was from contact with him, from inviting him into their home, from serving him, from staying at his feet, from sharing at table with him and seeing that they belong to his family. They had learned so much from welcoming Jesus into their home that they even knew he was the Lord of the living and could conquer death, which is powerful. And that can happen to us as well. We can get courageous enough to know that Jesus is even more powerful than death when we invite him, when we come to his table, when we feed on him, more and more, we change. We change. St. Augustine used a, a beautiful image. He said, when, when we eat regular food, it dissolves and becomes part of our bloodstream. It becomes part of us. But when we eat the food that is Christ, we become part of him. When we eat the Eucharist, we become part of him and become more like him and realize that we belong to him. Coming to his table often will change us and maybe even give us courage, even in the face of death. 
I kind of wish I had the faith of, of Martha and Mary when I was your age and, and a little older. Um, my dad passed away when I was 20 years old after a year battle with a brain tumor. And I had been, I had grown up Catholic, but I was, I had fallen away and wasn't practicing my faith. And when my dad got sick, I just got angry. And I prayed that he would be healed. Maybe the first prayer I'd prayed in years. And the answer was no. And I didn't know what to do with that. And after my, my dad passed away, I probably had a good two years of just being angry and feeling so robbed, you know? I didn't care about other people's pain, you know? I had 20 years with my father. I know some people had no fathers in their lives or abusive fathers. My, mine was a great dad, and I felt like he was taken from me so soon. I felt like there was no pain like mine, and I was hurt in a big way. And, you know, they say hurt people will hurt people. It's kind of what I did for a couple of years, uh, you know, drinking and, and getting lost in that party scene and, and hurting some young ladies that wanted to get close to me. It was just not good because I was acting out of a, a pain in my life, feeling and kind of identifying myself with it. I'm the one who got robbed of his dad at a young age. And then something happened, again, just a couple of years later, when my uncle invited me to, to make a pilgrimage and started to talk about what a pilgrimage is. And I found myself waking up in the middle of the night thinking about Jesus. Why did I not want to go on a pilgrimage? I woke up in the middle of the night. I was 22 years old. And I just started thinking about Jesus for the first time as, as an adult. And I kind of reasoned it out. I, I, if God is real, he should be the most important thing in my life. I, I guess I believe he's real. Why is he not important in my life? And again, you know, one of the most important days in my life, I remember it so vividly, it was three in the morning. And I was sitting at my desk in my dorm room in college thinking about God and trying to get my thoughts together. And I had an experience of Jesus touching me inwardly and letting me know that he loved me. And that was it. I had never had anything like that before. I didn't even believe that something like that was real. It was just suddenly I felt like Jesus was present. I didn't even know who he was at that point in my life. I just knew that I was in pain. And I was angry at him for taking my dad. And I had been making some bad choices one after the next and hurting people on the way. And yet Jesus broke into my life and touched me with love and didn't judge me. And that's the fascinating thing when I look back at that night. I didn't feel judged at all, even though I was living a, a morally bad life and I was probably as far away from the Lord as I had, I had ever been. And yet he touched me in a way where I just felt completely loved. And I wept right there at my desk in my dorm room, three in the morning, my roommate asleep in the bed. And things began to change. I went to confession the next day. It had been a good seven or eight years, so it was quite the confession. Went back to Eucharist, to Mass, to the sacraments, and started to listen, maybe for the first time. I had gone to Mass as a kid, but um, I never listened. Now I, now I wanted to know more. Who is this? Who is this Jesus? Is he real? I wanted to listen Suddenly, I was motivated to read the Bible because I, I, I wanted to know who he was, and I felt his love, and I wanted to know more about that love and experience it more. And he revealed to me, too, that his mother was real, and Mary wanted a, a role in my life, and I started to learn about her as well. And life 
began to change for me in ways that I did not expect at all. I did not know I was going to be here. I did not know I would be a priest. If, if I had a list of possible occupations and careers when I was 18 years old and you put priest on it, I would have put it way down the bottom as a possibility. But suddenly, Jesus let me know he was real and that he loved me. And I wanted to know him. And so, having lost my father two years earlier, suddenly I was on a quest to know my heavenly father as Jesus would reveal him to me. And I started to learn who the father is. And then as that unfolded, I started to feel a call to priesthood in the Franciscan order. And as I pursued that, I realized that I was becoming a father as well. And now, it's fascinating, when I think of the story of my life, I often tell it beginning with the death of my dad. And at the time, I thought well, that was the end of the story, right? I thought this is the greatest tragedy I could possibly imagine. My father passed away, and I'm just a man in pain, and I'm going to live out of that pain and maybe take it out on the rest of the world. But the Lord would have none of that. And he started to show me that wasn't the end of the story, but the beginning. Losing my father set me on a path to find my heavenly father and then to become a father to so many people who I really feel are like family to me. It's a grace, but it's also a decision how we use our pain and how we look at our suffering, right? We can look at it like it's the end of the story. I've been hurt. I've been destroyed. I'm broken. That's who I am. I'm going to live out of that for the rest of my life. I'm hurt, and I will hurt others. Or we could see it as the beginning of the story. What we do with the pain is important. And when we come to know Jesus Christ we, and start to understand that we belong to him, he teaches us how to view pain. He teaches us on the cross how to look at suffering and not see it as the end of the story because the cross is not the end of the story for him either. He rises from the dead and restores life and opens up the gates of heaven and brings about the salvation of the world. It doesn't stop at the pain of the cross. It is used to bring about the glory of God. And when we eat of his flesh and drink his blood, we are brought into the family of God and can start to see the suffering in our lives in similar ways that Jesus sees his suffering. Again, my dad's death was the beginning, not the end. Sometimes you meet people who choose to make their pain the beginning and not the end. You know, I, I, I knew a man, and when he was a young boy, he had um, some very serious health complications that put him in the hospital again and again, long periods of time in the hospital. But he survived all that, and he grew up, and today he's a doctor. You know? And when I think of him, I think that's one beautiful success story. There's a guy who was in a lot of pain as a child and used that pain as the beginning of the story. His time in the hospital as a little boy made him compassionate and made him want to grow up to be a doctor to relieve the pain of others. He could have just looked at his illness as the end, and I'm going to identify myself with it and, and live out of that pain, but he used it as the beginning. And a vocation opened up for him in which he would help others to relieve the pain that they feel, just like the doctors that had helped him. And maybe there are 
individuals who lose parents at a young age or even through divorce don't have a, a mom or dad in, in their lives. And, and that's awful and it's a, it's a very real pain. But I do know um, another couple, both the husband and the wife, um, had parents who were divorced or dead young and they decided to adopt five children. And when I heard that story, I just thought, this is another example, right? Their pain was not the end of the story, but the beginning. They know what it's like to not have a mom or a dad around. And when they found each other, they decided together to adopt so that these five children would not know the pain of being parentless. And that's the option for us, brothers and sisters, right? We all have uh, tough things in our lives, and something, some things are really tough and almost unspeakable how, how hard they can be for us. But when we see that we belong to God's family, we hear an invitation to bring our sufferings to him and invite him to use them. It's never the end of the story with Jesus Christ. It's, it's the beginning. We can always choose how we respond to anything in our lives. And when we belong to God's family and feast on his body and blood, we hear that invitation to bring him our pain as well and let him transform it. Let him change it. Let him change us by taking us through what is most difficult, and bringing about new life. So tonight, as you know, this is a very beautiful night and a, a moment that we're getting to now. We're going to have some uh, Eucharistic adoration, right? We're going to have some time in the presence of, of Jesus Christ, who is fully present in the Eucharist, his body, blood, soul, and divinity will be present right here on this stage for all of us. Think about that for a moment. Jesus is in this room and wants to look at you and love you. Maybe he's going to call you to something tonight, you know? Maybe you'll, if you, if you listen in your heart, maybe you'll hear a call to, to a little bit more prayer or maybe to going to the Eucharist more often, maybe not just on Sundays, maybe some daily Masses where you can commune with him and feast on him and know that you belong to him. Or maybe he'll invite you to look at your suffering courageously and give it to him. Maybe he wants to transform the pain in your life and so help you to see that it is not an end. It is not what defines you, but could perhaps be the beginning of something beautiful coming in your life. So I invite you, brothers and sisters, just to close your eyes for a moment and, and please pray with me. Father in heaven, you call us to be part of your family. You remind us that we belong to you. And that gives us eternal worth and great beauty. You sent your son Jesus, Lord, to show us in human flesh what you are all about. Give us the courage now to enter more deeply into the heart of your son, to listen more attentively to the message he has for us tonight, and to maybe even 
with courage. Show him some of our wounds. Bring to him our pain and suffering that he may transform it. Remind us that it is not the end of the story. Just another page in the book of our lives. Use it all, Lord. Suffering is not the end for us. You are. You are with us now. You are leading us into glory. Be with us. Help us to pray tonight and to celebrate the wonders of your love. 